Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Voles are small rodents that can do tremendous damage to plants. Today, we're gonna to talk about them. Also, what are micronutrients? How about a hybrid? We're going to define these in other gardening terms. That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by Goodwinds Landscape and Garden Center in Germantown since 1943 and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation. The WKNO Production Fund. The WKNO Endowment Fund. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to The Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Mr. D. And we also have Dr. Kelly. Dr. Kelly is a consumer horticulture specialist with Mississippi State University Extension. Thanks for joining us today. Glad to be here. Yeah, great All to be here. All right, Mr. D, you're up first. Oh. So, let's mm. talk about voles. Voles. Because one of the questions that we get at the office a lot is about voles. I understand that because there are a lot of voles around. I grew up calling them field mice, okay. is what we always call them. They're, you know, they're, they're, they're uh, little short mouse looking critters. They have a short tail, which differentiates them from a, from a house mouse. They are extremely prolific. They burrow, they feed on plant material. They, unlike moles and armadillos, they like roots and and they will kill your ornamentals. They are commercially important. They'll, they, I've seen them invade commercial orchards and kill fruit trees. Mm -hmm. By in the winter time, they will actually girdle the, the, the plants. They'll eat bark in the winter time. So they're really, really nasty little critters. And it's one of the few critters that I talk about. Uh, I use this Prevention and Control yeah. of Wildlife Damage book, but it's one of the few critters I talk about where it says shooting. <laughs> is not practical or effective. They're too small, they're hard to hit, and they, they stay underground most of the time. But very quickly, I'm going to show you that the to there are a couple of toxicants that are listed. So uh, using uh, uh, a rodent, rodenticides uh, are probably one of the most effective means of controlling these, mm -hmm. and there are a couple of them out there, uh, zinc phosphide and then the anticoagulant rodenticides are a little slower acting, but they do a pretty good job. And even uh, a snap trap, mouse yeah. trap, if you mm. bait it with peanut butter or something like that, you know, can be effective. Or, or you can catch a few, but but in a laboratory situation, <laughs> one of these little mama voles produce 17 litters in one year. Wow, that's a lot. 17 litters? 17 litters. How many in a litter? That's they a lot. range from three to 13 or 14. Whoa. That's a lot. Dude. Most that's of them on lot. the average are three yeah. to six or something mm -mm -mm. like that. Mm -mm. So they're very, cool. very prolific critters. Uh, they can do a lot of damage. You know, and, and, and you'll see the tunnels. Yes. You see where they come up. There'll be a hole about inch and a quarter, inch and a half in diameter where they come up and and then they'll tunnel under things. And, and uh, if you use one of the anticoagulants or zinc phosphide baits, uh, probably be a good idea to pour them in the tunnels right. because they are toxic to some birds and it might keep other you know, critters from getting to them. You can also buy bait stations you know, and, or create a cover, or create a bait station okay. with the baits in there that'll keep other critters from getting to it. There are 23 vole species in the United States. Most of the wow. ones we have in our area are the pine vole. Okay. I think that's the most common one here. But uh, just they're 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 really tough to control, um, and and I would use all of these methods wow. that I've talked all about. Yeah, you know, not. And you just can't one. just do it one time because it, it, they'll come back yeah. and you, come back. That's and exactly come back. right. If you yeah. completely wipe them off your property. Uh, yeah. Another vole will come walking by and say, "Hey, man, there's some empty space over yeah. there." And they'll, they'll move right in. Uh, <laughs> Mr. D, can you do can you do us a favor? Can you explain anticoagulant? An anticoagulant is uh, a, a product that, when they ingest it, 
it will cause them to internally bleed themselves okay. to death. And usually, it, uh, in the process, it makes them thirsty. Mm. And, and so, for as far as rat, rats and mice and in your house or under your house or in your attic, it's a good thing because it will make them go out and find water and hopefully they'll die out there close to the watering oh, hole. Okay. Mm. The voles, it's not that important because they're outside anyway right. uh, for the most part. Now, I've, some of these critters, the voles will come in. I've caught voles with, on my sticky traps in my garage. Huh. You know, they come into my mm. garage every okay. once in a while, not that common. But uh, uh, they, they uh, are just, they're extreme. You know, they, they, they are predated upon by hawks and owls and coyotes and things like that. But there's not enough of those predators out and there. And snakes, right? Snakes. Snakes. Yes, will snakes. Get them too. Uh, rat yeah. snakes, especially. Right, you know, yeah. rat snakes alone. Because they'll go down yeah, in the tunnel. They'll go in there. They can, they're yeah. one of the few critters that will go down and get them. Right. Yeah. That's a good reason to, to not kill beneficial snakes because the snakes, to me, like the rat snakes and the king snakes, those are the ones you want in your garden because if you have a vole problem, that can mm -hmm. help. They you can, know? can definitely and help. And one thing I have found too that a lot of people clientele will will think that it's a mold yes. because they'll see those tunnels mm -hmm. yeah. and they'll think and you know voles will take mm -hmm. over an so old abandoned mold, mold tunnel yeah. right. and that's why a lot that. of people think that the damage to the plants is the molds mm -hmm. And it's not. not. No, it's, it's not. It's the voles. It's the voles. Yeah. yeah. Right. And they love expensive plant materials. Oh yeah, you know, like I the, had them. Uh, yeah. The hostas. The yeah. hostas and roses. Oh, yeah. Yeah. roses right. I had a really pretty knockout rose that was several years old, and it was probably as tall as I am. And uh, I noticed that it was just totally wilty. Mm -hmm. And I went out there, and it was kind of leaning. And I picked it up, and not a root on it. It was gnawed to just a knob. Yeah. And of course, it was. Wow. That's it. And hostas will just disappear, just won't disappear. they, Chris? They, they will just disappear. Yeah, they sure will. It's like that old Bugs Bunny cartoon where the, he's <laughs> underground, he's pulling the carrots yeah. down as he goes, that's you know? Yep, that's how it is. That's what they that's do. That's it. Yeah. They took that that's from what those voles do, buddy. That's right. Uh, so try all the methods, is yeah. pretty much what Mr. D was saying. Yeah, so. And keep doing wow. it. And keep doing it. Yeah. Wow. Postpartum breeding is common. Uh, females can breed as early as two weeks of age. Wow. Uh, oh, you know, like I said, 17 litters. Litter sizes range from 1 to 11. They need to come out with some says. kind of yeah, faults. Yeah. You know how insects have pheromones, you know. Yeah. Gestation period is 21 for... days. Okay. So, you know, wow. quick. a, a vole that is, okay, two weeks plus 21 days is, what, five week yeah. old? Five or six weeks, yeah. Five week old vole is producing babies Reproducing. already. Wow. You know? That's so. scary. How about that? We're going to uh, be overrun. Take them out. Take them out. <laughs> All right, Mr. D, we appreciate that. That's some good stuff. There are a number of gardening events going on in the next couple of weeks. Here are just a few that might interest you. All right, Dr. Kelly, let's look at some gardening terms. And these are real good terms that people hear all of the time but may not know what they actually mean. So let's exactly. start with amendment. Amendment. All right, we're not talking about to the Constitution, no. right? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> we're talking about horticulture and in That's gardening. Right. Okay, when people talk about amendments, they're talking about things they add to their soil mm -hmm. to improve it. That could be fertilizers to improve the fertility. It could be things that change the structure to make it retain water or whole water, whichever is needed. Okay. It could be peat moss, uh, compost, any kind of really good organic matters you looked at as an amendment. Gin trash, mm -hmm. you know, leaf okay. mold, things like that. So that's what that's what we mean when we say it could be lime. Okay. Sure. Sand you know. even. Well, yeah, yeah. lime and, and uh, sulfur sense. if you want to lower the pH, if you got blueberries yeah. or something. So yeah. anything that's added to the soil to improve it for the plant you're growing, whatever those conditions require. Okay. Our next term is bolt. Bolt? Yes. Okay. That's what plants do when the conditions are right, environmental conditions are right, to make them set seed. 
and we usually think of it as the cool weather plants like the mustard greens. Mm, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, exactly. mustard greens, you know, they will bolt when the, the temperatures get higher, the days get long. They will automatically, their little clock tells them that they've got to set seed and die. Coriander, cilantro, okay. you know, is a cool season yeah. herb that we grow and it will bolt as soon as it gets to be hot weather, meaning that it will turn from vegetative to reproductive okay. and go into the seed stage and then die. Okay. So that's what that means. Is there any way you can slow that process down? Not really. Okay. You could cut the seeds or the blooms off, but the very next tissue coming out is yeah. going to be a bloom. So, yeah, makes sense. you know, basil is the same way people will say, oh, I keep, you know, I can't use my basil because it's flowering. Well, and you can't keep it from flowering, no matter how often you cut it. Next thing it's going to do, that's what annuals are programmed that's right. to okay. set seed and die. And die. Yeah. Annuals, right. Yeah. Okay. Our next term is heirloom. And of course, we hear this one a lot. Yeah, we usually we think about heirloom plants as being those. And a lot of people disagree about exactly yeah. what the age has to be of the heirloom seed, how long that has to be around. Okay. But typically, I think about 50 years. If the seed has right. been out, we have a lot of old heirloom varieties of vegetables right, right, right. that have been Tomatoes, around. Uh, yeah, like all brandy, of the time. Wine. brandy wine. Yeah, right. that's the one. Cherokee and purple. some of the yeah. corn has been around and watermelon seeds, you know. And then there's heirloom flower seed as well okay. that's been out for a very long time and usually typical about 50 years. And they're usually uh, seed that have will breed true from seed to seed, okay. that's how they have become open pollinated, that's what that means, okay. that they will set seed that are true from generation to generation, yeah. in other words, they're stable over time in different generations, okay. and that's why they have been carried on by people who have brought, you know, bring, my grandmother always uh, didn't pick half of a pea row of her black eyed peas <laughs> or her uh, green beans, she'd let them go to seed. And okay. those were the old heirloom varieties that her grandmother okay. had, and that's how that she knew that it would be the same bean or okay. the same pea. Yeah. And uh, so that's sense. why we really kind of cherish those old varieties because they have a lot of tradition and sure. family memories, and then they're good. They're good varieties, a lot of them. Yeah, passed some down better from generation to generation. Yeah, sometimes. exactly. Okay. Yep. All right. So here's the, the next term, which is one that's very difficult for folks to understand: hybrid. Hybrid. Oh, hybrid. yeah, yeah. That's those cars, right? <laughs> <laughs> the new, yeah. yeah. The new hybrid cars. <laughs> the new hybrid cars, yeah. Okay, next one. <laughs> yeah, hybrids can get a little bit yeah, sticky little because in, in plants, a hybrid is something that we have manipulated. Okay. It's not something that typically we term as occurring in nature, although they do. Plants cross pollinate between you know, different species all the time. Sure. But a hybrid is something that's usually done by scientists to cross two different varieties of, say, tomatoes to get a better plant. Okay. Typically, it would be to get those traits that would make it a better product, a better tomato, more disease resistance, oh, okay. you know, things like mm -hmm. that. So a hybrid is a plant that is a cross between two different parents. And a lot of times that if you save the seed from a hybrid, which is questions, we get those too, mm -hmm. right, Chris? Yes, we do. We they sure sometimes do. will not breed true right. because they're from two different lines. Right. And then that plant sets seed. Well, obviously, it was pollinated from something else, so you're not really going to get that hybrid plant. So the only way you'd get another hybrid plant was to go back to the original cross, cross again, mm -hmm. wow. you know, and get the hybrid plant that way. Or you can, you know, like a tomato, you could, you know, clone it, take a cutting. You know, we talked about, we talked about taking that the mm -hmm. suckers from tomato yeah, plants. Yeah, right. I mean, that would, that's a clone. Mm -hmm. So that's the same as the parent. But that's usually what hybrids are, something that we have manipulated through genetic breeding, you know, to mm -hmm. establish a, a new plant that has good characteristics of both parents. Okay. Well done, because that was always <laughs> difficult. It's always difficult. All right, next group of terms, herbaceous versus woody. Yeah, okay. okay. That's a good one. That's good. Yeah, that's uh -huh. easier though because herbaceous are plants that are have succulent tissue. In other words, they will die down when conditions are not right, mm -hmm. whether that's 
a cold weather, whether it's drought or whatever, they will go dormant. And the perennial part is the bottom part. So an herbaceous plant, if you're an annual, it's going to die. The whole right. thing's herbaceous. So we're talking about things like zinnias and watermelons and anything that has succulent tender tissue that it will die. Okay. But when we talk about a woody plant or uh, usually we think of, and that's the term we use in the ornamental nursery mm -hmm. industry, woodies are plants like trees, trees and shrubs yes. and ground mm -hmm. covers that have hard tissue that will be there throughout the growing season. If it's a deciduous, it's going to lose its leaves, but you still have the hard tissue or the structure, the limbs and the branches and the trunk or okay. whatever. So, All right. Yep. That's good. Here's our next term, micronutrients. Yeah, that yeah. one. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I can name them all. I wrote no, them down. I can't name them all. <laughs> but micronutrients are the nutrients that are required by plants in very minute amounts. Mm -hmm. That's why they're called micronutrients, Micron not like nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus, right. which are used by plants in large amounts. Right. So, and some fertilizers will have micronutrients in them, which is a good thing because plant, let me see if I can name them, Chris. Chlorine, boron, iron, zinc, magnesium, molybdenum. Copper. Copper. Yeah. Ah, we got it. <laughs> That's got them. It. Yeah. Is sulfur considered one? No, I don't think it is. Uh-uh. I'll have a look at my notes here now. <laughs> but I no, think I don't think it is. I don't think it is. Uh -uh. Mm -mm. All right. So you nailed it. Yeah. Well, you did. You did with your help. <laughs> All right, Doc. We appreciate those gardening terms. Sure. And, uh, no problem. We're here in the garden and we've got a blight on the ends of our tomatoes and you can see it starts at the ground level because the, the soil gets wet and splashes up and puts the blight on the bottom of the tomato and it works its way up the tomato. And the, but the top looks good. So to prevent this from get, continuing getting fusarium blight, we're going to um, spray with a fungicide, copper-based or daconil. You need to get good coverage on the leaves. Again, this is a preventative. A little bit of the undersides. This will be effective until the rain washes it off. But that wraps it up. That will be protected now. And if you would like to, mulch underneath your tomatoes and that will help prevent the fusarium from getting up on the tomatoes. All right, this is our Q&A session. Y'all ready for this? Great questions, though. Great questions. Here's our first via email. I have three autumn ferns planted in a group. One of my ferns had fronds turning brown at the tips and moving down to the ground, killing the entire frond. What is this? Will it kill the fern and spread to the <laughs> others? This is Miss Jean in Brighton. So, Doc, what is this? Is it going to kill Well, it? I'd really like to talk to this lady because... Okay. <laughs> Because it's, it could be, how old are the plants? Mm. You know, when were they put in? Yeah, okay. Okay. if they're young plants and she just put them in, she, all she'd have to do is miss a couple of good waterings. And then the plant would start dying back frond by frond or yeah. you know, the tips curling yeah. back. And then the weather we've had, See, I thought about you know, the weather, the weather the, with the, the like weather. we talked about with the wind and the heat index. And you know, you've got to really be, and, and ferns, even autumn ferns require pretty consistent moisture mm -hmm. to stay really lush. And, and look their best. So it may be she needs to look, pay a little bit more attention to the watering. Okay. I don't think it sounds like a disease. I didn't think you it know, did. But if it continues to happen after she's watering, you know, it could be there is something going on with them. But I don't uh, know of anything specifically that attacks. You know, there burn. are some, uh, well, nematodes will attack well, and scales. Ah, yeah, yeah they I didn't do think of that. scales from time to time. Yeah. But you can take care of that pretty easily. Yeah. Um, but. Yeah, I, I didn't think that initially. I thought environmental conditions. Yeah, you know, yeah. Was the first thing that this came time to my mind. of year, yeah. you know, the the time of year that it is and the heat we've had, people are going to be seeing a lot of problems right. with their plants if they just got to remember to just be vigilant. Okay, and keep consistent a good watering. Eye. Yeah. All right. So there you have it, Miss Jean. Hope that helps you out. Here's the next viewer email. I was told lichen would not kill trees, but it's spreading and killing the trees is getting on. What shall I do? And this is Cindy from Spring Hill. Uh, so lichen, and she thinks they're killing the trees. Look, look, yeah. look, look, look at Mr. D. 
Look at the yeah, head. No. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> no. I know that is a common, common misconception. Oh, it is. But it's an indicator organism. In other words, it's indicating that there's something wrong with that plant and the lichen comes in as a secondary thing to take advantage of you know, the, the plant not doing well. The plant's stressed, it's got root problems, it's been girdled, or something's going on. It's got too much water, you know, mm -hmm. that's standing over the roots. There could be any number of things. Sure. Planted in the wrong place, gets yeah. too much sun, you know, not enough sun. So there's something Planted too going deep. on. Yeah, too that's deep. exactly yeah. right, yeah. you know. So Anything it's else? not the lichens. Uh, yeah, just not say, the lichens. I'd just say lichens are not taking any nutrition from that tree. Yeah. But lichens do need, you know, what their symbiotic relationship between an algae and, and a fungi, fungi. Yeah. and mm -hmm. they do need sunlight to survive. So any, so as the foliage gets that's less right. and less in the tree, then the lichens are getting more sunlight, and so they're that's why they're spreading. But they're not causing that foliage to get thinner; they're simply reacting to that right. additional sunlight. And that's a uh, that's why it's easy for to understand why people think. Oh, yeah. Because right. they you know, get that. more prolific as that plant defoliates because of, yeah. like you said, it's secondary. Yeah, it's, it's getting the sunlight to, to, to do their growth right. cycle. Yeah. So it's nothing to worry about, Miss Cindy. It's not killing your tree. That's something else. But something yeah. is. Something yeah, is. Something is. Yeah. Something yeah. Else. What is. She needs yeah. to look elsewhere yeah. and look at the trunk, look at the soil. Look and see if there's any uh, lesions or cankers yeah. any or bores, yeah, you know, bo looking, yeah, what bores, any, yeah. anything, anything like that, yeah, okay. exactly. All right, so there you have it, Miss Cindy. Hope that helps you out. Here's our next viewer email. On one of your shows, you said straw would be good in a tomato bed. <laughs> I used it, and now I have Johnson grass and weeds from you the must, straw. You said that, right? You said that. We're gonna put that on Mr. Day. Yeah, you said. My that. bed was clear <laughs> from weeds, but clear. now it is. Full of them. <laughs> Are there different kinds of straw? And this is Miss Emma in Nashville. So, <laughs> Mr. D, we, we, said, we said straw. We didn't say she, hay. She, no, we you didn't, didn't say, say weed seed. <laughs> That's right. If you if you uh, get good wheat straw, pure wheat, wheat straw. Wheat straw. Okay. All right. Uh, all you're going to get is wheat coming yeah, out. All you're going to get is a little bit of wheat. Well, if they did a good job of harvesting wheat, you <laughs> yeah, won't get much did. wheat. Uh, but you will get. You probably you will get, get a little bit. But all you'll get is wheat. <laughs> but uh, but there are definitely different kinds of straw. But definitely do not use hay. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes you can get hay yeah. that that is maybe <laughs> cheaper than good good quality wheat straw. But yeah, there's rice straw, there's wheat straw, there's a lot of different kinds of straw. But uh, uh, yeah, hay yeah. is going to have you got Johnson grass, you got yeah. all these other yes. things, and <laughs> exactly. then you d you didn't get a good quality straw. Right. It's going to have a lot of viable <laughs> weed seeds and like Johnson grass for sure. Ooh, yeah, use yeah. use the other straw. Yeah. He should be fine. Thanks pine for straw. Emma. Pine, pine straw. straw. Yeah, that'd be there good. Go. If she's got a sore mm -hmm. yeah. right. All right. Thank you, Ms. Emma. Hope that helps you out. Uh, here's our next viewer email. What type of tree is this, and are the nuts edible? Mm. Mr. D, do we need to spray? And this is uh, from Charles right here in Cordova. So there it is on the screen. Yeah. All right. What do you think there, Mr. D? I think it's a hickory yeah. think it's a of hickory. some type. We used to call them hickory nuts when I was Yeah, we did too. Good place Pig to nuts, squirrel hunt. Nuts, Good place yeah. to squirrel hunt. Now, they are edible. <laughs> Those nuts are edible. Okay. Now they're a little hard to crack. You've heard yep. of a nut that's hard to crack. You know, that's uh, it. Huh? That's right. Hickory need a is pretty hammer. tough to crack. Your pecan cracker won't do the trick. No. On you. You <laughs> use a hammer and a brick and wow. or an anvil. Yep. But they're very tasty. Uh, and uh, but as spray, no. Uh, I've never seen a hickory that required spraying. They'll have some of the same problems as pecans. They, they, they have uh, phylloxera will get okay. on hickories and, and some of the critters, but that, that shell is so tough. I don't think uh, even a stink bug can, <laughs> really? can get oh, that must on be a tough, hickory. Man. You know, now I, I see, on, if you tough. blow up that picture, you see a little spot on that shuck, but the shuck is like a quarter of an inch thick and then the shell is, is really thick and they would wow. really have to be infecting that or feeding on that yeah. nut when it's really real, young, real small, yeah. when it's really young, and I, the hickory would probably throw that off. So I've never seen an insect <coughs> problem right now. Have you? No. On hickory? No. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, but for us, to, you know, it's a good picture, but for us to really know what kind of hickory it is, we need to get out there and see that tree. 
We there's so many to, different kinds. Tell them know. to crack some of those nuts this fall and send us to them. We can, we can tell from the taste, mm. don't you think? I don't know about the taste. You know about the taste? Mm, they all taste good to me. <laughs> the, the way they're shaped, maybe. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, there's so many different we hickories. We taste tests. You know, pig nut hickory. I thought sand hickory is probably what that may be. Yeah, there the are so liquid. many hickories. But there's so many. I need to see the bark. I need yeah. to see the bark. You need to see the bark. You need to see the bark. Yep. Yeah. Because I actually learned from Miss Weta and the Shelby County Extension Forestry Team that looking at the bark is key in determining the kind of trees you have. So because if we saw that bark, we could probably tell you what kind of hickory that is. Especially in the wintertime. Mm. Yeah. yeah, well, you saw you <laughs> yeah. have to look That's at. Right. That's right. <laughs> the yeah, bark so or the nuts, you just, yeah. Yeah. Either one or the other. Mm -hmm. All right, so Dr. Kelly, Mr. D, we're out of time. Thanks. Thank you. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplots at wkno.org and the mailing address is Family Plot 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. You can get more information on things we talked about on today's show by going to familyplotgarden.com. You can also ask us your gardening questions and see it answered on TV. Thanks for watching. I'm Chris Cooper. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe. Funding for the Family Plot Gardening in the Mid South is provided by Goodwin's Landscape and Garden Center in Germantown since 1943 and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation, the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you.